Writing is a very difficult art form. One major difficulty when starting to write a novel or a short story is deciding which perspective to take. We all learn about the three main ones in high school, right? First person, third person limited, and third person omniscient. As readers, we attach ourselves to certain perspectives unconsciously. For instance, most modern contemporary fiction is written in the first person. This means that many modern readers unconsciously enjoy that perspective without realizing it. This attachment is often pervasive and inextricably linked to genre. Romance and fantasy lend themselves to the first-person perspective because they make for very personal stories, allowing the reader to immerse themselves in the main character. Historical and literary fiction, on the other hand, sound much nicer when written in third person. This is because the worlds and characters of these stories need special care and construction, and while they are meant to be enthralling and metaphorical, the focus is not generally centered on immersion. Many readers who try different genres and find that they can't get into them often don't realize that a large contributing factor in their dislike is a change in perspective, and focusing on just how hard it is to write perspective well can make us much, much better readers. To do this, I want to look at some passages from three very different books. In doing so, it may seem as if I am putting down some books or authors as I compare their work to others, but this is not the case. In fact, I think it is very important to predicate any literary analysis with the statement that there are no bad books. Saying some books are bad and some books are good is just not what literary critics do. Novels are simply too complex, there is too much there to condense into a single judgment, and if you find yourself telling others that you found a book bad, then I would urge you to reevaluate your relationship with literature. Now, with that out of the way, let's start with the first page of a very popular book right now, and we will analyze its perspective. Don't worry, this will be a spoiler-free analysis. The Invisible Life of Adi LaRue is a contemporary romance novel with fantasy themes and Faustian framing. The first page goes like this. The girl wakes up in someone else's bed. She lies there, perfectly still, tries to hold time like a breath in her chest, as if she can keep the clock from ticking forward, keep the boy beside her from waking, keep the memory of their night alive through sheer force of will. She knows, of course, that she can't, knows that he'll forget, they always do. It isn't his fault, it is never their fault. The boy is still asleep, and she watches the slow rise and fall of his shoulders, the place where his dark hair curls against the nape of his neck the scar along his ribs, details long memorized. His name is Toby. Last night she told him hers was Jess. She lied, but only because she can't say her real name, one of the vicious little details tucked like nettles in the grass, hidden barbs designed to sting. What is a person, if not the marks they leave behind? She has learned to step between the thorny weeds, but there are some cuts that cannot be avoided. A memory. A photograph. A name. In the last month, she has been Claire, Zoe, Michelle, but two nights ago when she was Ella and they were closing down a late-night cafe after one of his gigs, Toby said that he was in love with a girl named Jess. He simply hadn't met her yet. So now, she is Jess. Toby begins to stir, and she feels the old familiar ache in her chest as he stretches, rolls toward her, but doesn't wake, not yet. His face is now inches from her, his lips parted in sleep, black curls shadowing his eyes, Dark Lashes Against Fair Cheeks An important thing to consider when analyzing perspective is to ask what the perspective is doing for the story. In this section, third person is used in a pretty standard way. Specifically, the novel is written in third person omniscient from the perspective of two different characters. These sentences, where the author expresses generalities about the life or a theme, are very rare in first person, as they often make the protagonist seem too prosaic or pretentious. The author uses the space between the storyteller and the main character to insert some beautifully poetic prose, something that would also seem very off-putting and strange in a first person narrative. However, we also see some of the difficulties with writing in third person crop up here. Here and here, there are some very short and overly expository sentences. The sentence, his name is Toby, is strangely isolated from its adjoining counterpart, and the brevity of the description stands out as different from the rest of the page. 
They are relatively unnatural compared to the rest of the paragraph and don't do much to add to the narrative elements of the scene. In fact, a critic could make an argument that the overall structure of the opening paragraphs would be greatly improved by simply omitting them altogether as opposed to rewriting them. They stand out as raw or clumsily inserted bits of exposition and are remnants of a common difficulty many writers have when trying to write in third-person omniscient, mainly telling what is happening instead of showing it. Now, this aphorism is bandied about by English teachers all over and is generally true, but not always. In fact, if the expository sentence is crafted with the perspective in mind, then even a very abrupt and telling sentence can add to the atmosphere of the style. It is up to the reader to say whether Schwab does this here, but in my personal critical opinion she has not. Regardless, despite it being a well-known saying, you will find many examples of awkward third-person delivery in some of the most popular books on the shelves. The truth is, it is really, really hard to write, and as much as perspective can be used as a tool to create brilliant styles of writing, it can also be a crutch and can lead to stories that are generally less enjoyable to read for someone paying attention. For our next example, we will look at another first page, and I want you to simply listen and pay special attention to what perspective it is in and how it uses that perspective to its advantage. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some they come in with the tide, for others they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing until the watcher turns his eye away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men. Now, Women forget all those things they don't want to remember, and remember everything they don't want to forget. The dream is the truth, then they act and do things accordingly. So the beginning of this was a woman, and she had come back from burying the dead. Not the dead of sick and ailing, with friends at the pillow and the feet. She had come back from the sodden and the bloated, the sudden dead, their eyes flung wide open in judgment. The people all saw her come because it was sundown. The sun was gone, but he had left his footprints in the sky. It was the time for sitting on porches besides the road. It was the time to hear things and talk. These sitters had been tongueless, earless, eyeless conveniences all day long. Mules and other brutes had occupied their skins. But now, the sun and the bossmen were gone, so the skins felt powerful and human. They became lords of sounds and lesser things. They passed nations through their mouths. They sat in judgment. This excerpt from Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God is incredible. There is no other way to put it. But the thing that makes it so incredible is her commitment and use of the third-person perspective. Just like Schwab did in Adia LaRue, Hurston uses her omniscient position to put to paper some of the most beautiful prose imaginable. But she doesn't stop there. From the third-person vantage point, she is able to insert ultimatums, sayings like those in the first paragraph that vividly relate the themes of her novel. She can sneakily confuse the reader with her use of pronouns. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board might make you think she's using the term man as an insert of humanity, and you, the reader, may not even notice she sticks to the masculine pronoun for the entire paragraph. That is, of course, until she mentions women, where her point is suddenly made clear. This would not be tenable if the story was told from the perspective of Hurston's main character, Janie. This obfuscation ironically allows her to be very upfront and personal with the reader, something that would not be possible if the novel was written in first person. Inside this, she adds small form details. The words time and watchers are both capitalized here and here, but noticeably death is not. Well, not yet. Later on in the story, death also becomes capitalized as it gains power over the characters. Not in the first lines, however. At this point, the powerful entities to Janie are the passing time of day and the people watching her return. Hurston is a writer, and because she wrote the novel with two dimensions between her and her characters, she can add these stylistic flourishes without the protagonist needing to be one as well. Unlike Schwab, there is no dead space. The frankness with which things are said is softened by the repetitional symmetry between sentences. The expositional sentence, the people all saw her come because it was sundown, is mirrored by the position of the same word in the following sentence, the sun was gone, but he had left his footprints in the sky. 
Again, we also have the masculine pronouns. No line stands alone and naked, and if exposition is needed, it is curved back into beautifully crafted prose. Hurston's understanding of how and why she writes in third person is legendary, and she is rightly regarded as one of the greatest writers of the last century. But we're not done yet. Let's take a look at one last novel. If you look up what perspective is the Brothers Katamasov in, you will find articles saying it is written in both first person and third person. This is sort of true, but the magic of Dostoevsky's use of perspective is masked by this rudimentary analysis. To put it in a sentence, the Brothers Karamazov is written in a special, blended perspective. This is to say that the story is a third-person narrative framed in a first-person dialogue. Now, I'm actually not going to read you the first page of the Brothers Karamazov, mostly because you should read it yourself, but also because the secret of Dostoevsky's point of view doesn't lie in his clever use of prose or symmetry or metaphor, though the novel has plenty of those as well. Instead, the big picture is what makes the Brothers Karamazov so brilliant. At the beginning of the novel, an unnamed narrator starts telling us the history of the Karamazov family, starting with the father. Though many intimate details of the family are told, the narrator remains apart, at least superficially, from the story he is telling. He often uses phrases like, as we called it, or our town, when discussing elements of our story, but he is still divided from the family. The aforementioned father, named Fyodor Pavlovich, is dead, something we are told happened exactly 13 years ago. He lived a life full of lust, greed, and debauchery, and though this is told to us in a matter-of-fact way, it is constantly interrupted with strange, human interjections, as the narrator refuses to explain some aspects of the tale, or simply admits that he doesn't know what happened. He consistently states opinions about the state of Russian politics and ideals, and even mentions Russian literary critics as if he expects to address them directly at some point about what he is about to say. Now, astute readers will quickly realize that one of the most striking things about the first couple chapters is the interesting connectedness that the narrator has with the man he is describing. Though the narrator admits that public opinion of the father was very poor, he never goes as far as to degrade the man or condemn him in some way. It struck me when I read it as well. Diligent listeners may already understand what I am leading to here, but I will say it outright. Fyodor Karamazov shares the same name with Fyodor Dostoevsky. You see, though Fyodor Karamazov never actually existed, his urges and ideas definitely did. His psychology, as brash and insane as it is, is not a fabrication. Fyodor Dostoevsky, the author and, yes, the narrator, is Fyodor Karamazov. But wait, Karamazov died 13 years ago, right? So how can Dostoevsky get away with this connection without it being painfully ethereal? Why even separate the narrator from the father in the first place? Why not just tell the story from Karamazov's perspective? Well, then we get into the second part of the story. Karamazov had four sons, Aryosha, Ivan, Dmitri, and Smirjakov, and the bulk of the novel includes long stretches of the perspectives from the first three. It starts off with the youngest, Alyosha, the monk, who holds a strong religious conviction along with a deep love of the people around him. Next it moves to Ivan, the stoic intellectual who secretly wrestles with immense psychological struggles throughout the story. Then, it shifts to Dmitri, the crazed and animalistic mirror of his father, who nonetheless seeks redemption and peace. Now, these sections all contain various personal thoughts and private actions of each character, something that is usually characteristic in third-person narratives. We hear aloud the struggles Dmitri goes through in his mental turmoil, and we experience the private happenings in Ivan's locked bedroom. This new perspective, different from the one at the beginning, allows us to look into the minds of the characters and relate to them. The narrator, somehow, has a window into the minds of the sons. Finally, at the end of the book, there is a trial. At this trial, every character has things to say, and we are ripped back into the first-person perspective. Now, as these people we have come to know intimately are called to the stand, we witness, literally, their conflicting statements and philosophies. Mental breaks and outbursts occur multiple times, and tensions grow and fade from day to day as the trial progresses. 
All of this we experience firsthand. Through the first person perspective, we are now back in. So, why? Why did Dostoevsky write his book like this? What we are looking at is a third person narrative framed in a first person one, and this structure, besides being very unusual and complicated, brings us closer to all the characters it passes over. Remember how the first person perspective gave us hints as to Dostoevsky's relationship to the father? Well, the third person shift is meant to mirror this, and does the same for each son. Just like Fyodor sees himself as Fyodor Karamazov, he also sees himself as the religious Alyosha, the intellectual Ivan and the manic Dmitri. But wait, you might say, why not just write the whole thing in third person then? If we can see that Dostoevsky sees himself in his characters while he writes in third person, then why do we need first person at all? And that is where the trial comes in. At this moment, as we are ripped back to Dostoevsky's point of view, we are now looking at it from a completely different lens. Now, instead of seeing these characters, these shades of the author as unbiased observers, we see them through Dostoevsky's own eyes. Dostoevsky himself is watching his conflicting ideas and emotions fight it out. He is literally witness to his own inner turmoil, and is just as much an observer to his manic and frenzied psychology as we are as readers. When you read The Brothers Karamazov, you're just as invested and interested in its resolution as the author is. And this fluid, multi-point of view style is what makes this book such an incredible example of the power of perspective in writing. To put it simply, The Brothers Karamazov is written in first person, omniscient. Something that can only be done if either one, the narrator is a deity or omnipresent entity in the story, which Dostoevsky is not, or two, if the narrator is also every other character. Without this push and pull of perspective, the ending wouldn't work. We would either be isolated into a single character's point of view and therefore be unable to see the lines between the characters start to blur, or we would be separated entirely from the narrator, and the connection between the reader and the author would fail to materialize. Through his choice to frame the narrative this way, Dostoevsky becomes the author, the narrator, the characters, and the reader. He has forged a perspective that allows him to be the creator of the story while also being all the characters inside of it. He has personified his mental struggles, voiced his midnight monologues, and at the end, stands back and watches it all unfold with us, his readers, as a witness. And that is what perspective can do to a story. I hope this video has given you a different look into how great authors use point of view. Focusing on how certain writers use these techniques to great effect can make the books we struggle to understand breathe again with complexity and life. And when that happens, reading becomes such a beautiful thing indeed.